NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory presents the Von Karman Lecture, a series of talks by scientists and engineers who are exploring our planet, our solar system, and all that lies beyond. Hello and a very pleasant good evening to you, wherever you may be. I am Brian White from JPL's Office of Communications and Education, and welcome to the Von Karman Talks. Tonight will be a steam-powered talk discussing how science influences art and art influences science. To do that, we'll get perspectives from both ocean world astrochemists and a visual art strategist. We'll also be doing something a little different later, so please make sure you stick around for that. Now, joining us as our co-host, fielding your questions this evening, is public outreach specialist, Talia Khan. Hi, Talia. Thank you, Brian. Hello. As always, we would like to remind our viewers that this is your space program, and we want you to be involved in the conversation this evening. So please ask questions in the chat, and our amazing social media team will be able to pass them along to us. We will be taking questions through YouTube chat, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and we'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible this evening. If you do not see the chat, please refresh your page and it should be there. Thank you very much, Dalia. Uh, if we run into any technical difficulties, folks, we ask that you stick with us, get those sorted out. Now, our first speaker is a research scientist and group supervisor in the Astrobiology and Oceans World Group at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. Please welcome Dr. Morgan Cable. Hiya, Morgan. Brian, how are you? I'm so excited to be here. It's so, so wonderful to have you here. Um, I wanna just start off with everybody at JPL, everybody at NASA has kind of their own superhero origin story. Um, what's yours? How'd you get here? Gosh, I don't know if I'm a superhero, but I would say I definitely <laughs> grew up inspired. Uh, so I grew up in Florida right next to Kennedy Space Center. And so for me, rockets going off in my backyard was just kind of normal. I didn't realize how unusual that was until I, I moved away, but it certainly had an impact on me. And I was always interested in science, uh, or at least asking questions, and then trying to figure out how to answer those questions. And my parents encouraged me from a very young age to, to do science projects and kind of get involved in my own education. So I did that and realized that my passion lied in chemistry. And to me, chemistry is the way that I can understand the language of the universe. You know, by the time you get into physics and black holes and all sorts of subatomic particles, things get a little weird. But for chemistry, you know, the way that molecules are born when bonds are made and broken, like I understand that. I can visualize that and I can go in the lab and do experiments to study that. And so I followed in my father's footsteps. He was a chemist as well and studied that in school. And then I stumbled across an internship for NASA when I was an undergraduate student in college and came over to the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab, where I basically have never left because it's such an amazing place. Uh, so I'd encourage anyone out there who's interested in studying science or engineering, do an internship. It's a great way for you to get a feel for what a career uh, doing that kind of job would be like. And so, yeah, I guess that's how I ended up studying astrochemistry, astrobiology, and searching for life in all these crazy places in our solar system and beyond. Very cool. And and what specifically, and I think you got some images here too, uh, what is an astrochemist? I mean, what what's the job do? Well, it's a chemist who studies places on Earth, but <laughs> beyond as well. And I've been lucky enough, if we pull up number two, you can see that I've uh, gotten the opportunity to do some field work too, as part of my job. Turns out there are a lot of cool places on Earth uh, here are some images of Iceland and a few caves where we can study environments here on Earth that are similar to other worlds. And we pull up number three. Now you can see I was really lucky to be able to go not only to Iceland, which you can see in the background there, but the top of Kilimanjaro. Now just to my, let's see, my left in that picture is a giant ice field 
that actually makes a pretty good analog for places like Jupiter's moon Europa and other of these icy uh, surfaces in our solar system. And so I get to study things like that. And I also get to go into the lab and do outreach. So if we go over to the number one, you can see a couple of photos here of uh, me getting to be able to do outreach for a space camp that I run. And there's a picture of me when I was pretty young and just starting to form these ideas of what it might be like to be a scientist. Um, very lucky to uh, be a triplet, actually. You could see my brother and sister there. They're the, the other kind of, of doctor, the ones that save lives. i uh, super proud of them. But um, we, we all ended up in some sort of science field, which is pretty cool. That is pretty cool. Um, let's, let's bring in our artists now. Let's talk a little bit about this. Uh, so our other speaker tonight, because this is science and art, uh, as a visual strategist with the Office of Communications and Education here at JPL, working with the design studio simply called The Studio. Please welcome Joby Harris. Hi, Joby. Hello. Hey, how's it now, going? Great to be We're happy to have you here. Um, your story's a little different than Morgan's, isn't it? <laughs> Just a little bit. I actually grew up next to Mars, if you want to go to slide five. Um, actually about a mile outside of Mars, Pennsylvania. It's a little town in Pennsylvania. You blink, you miss it, but it does have a Mars National Bank. I've told our Mars team here that there is a 24 hour ATM there if they need any more money. Uh, but yeah, I grew up near Mars. That would be probably the closest I would get to anything involving space if you go to slide six, as my grades were not exemplary at all, like Morgan's. I think Morgan told me she got a B once um, and I, my family would throw parties if I got B's. So I struggled in math, obviously. That F is not for fantastic. I loved drawing. I was an artist, clearly liked playing Twister with Twister in the background there. But uh, I was set to be an artist my whole life. Um, and if you go to the next slide, slide seven, I actually ended up moving to Los Angeles and became a full-time artist doing digital illustration. I was doing storyboards for TV and film. I was doing graphic design. I worked as a production designer and art director making props and, and uh, sets, building sets. Uh, I even started directing commercials, started directing music videos. So I kind of ran the whole gamut of, uh, as an artist, even getting involved in music, playing noisy rock bands and yelling, yelling and weird stuff like that. So I, I, I absolutely embodied an artist. Uh, if you go to slide eight, I, uh, you know, artists aren't very good at um, managing their time or their finances because we're so passionate about what we do. Um, that's why we'll jump on helping a friend with a wedding, you know, invitation all the way to a larger job. Uh, so I knew I wanted something a little bit more consistent. And to be honest, I wanted something a little bit more meaningful. And so I got a call from this guy, Dan Goods. Dan Goods is my current supervisor at the studio. But he ended up calling me one day and said, Joby, I, I need someone who can wear a bunch of different hats artistically uh, to help support these scientists and engineers who are coming in here with these really, really unique needs. And we really want to assist them. So I started working at JPL. I had no idea what I was going to be doing or if I could even contribute uh, if you go to slide nine. Within the first couple of years, I found myself doing graphic design and doing illustration uh, in early mission formulation, uh, helping proposals like for planet finding telescopes. And, um, and even as you can see there, there's an there's image of ingenuity there. So I think it's coming up on its 10th flight this coming weekend. It's, I think it's gonna you know, go up higher and do greater things. But a long time ago, it was just an idea in Mimi Ong's you know, mind and her team. Um, and so I got to support them doing some art early on. And then for, for brilliant people like Morgan, you know, doing doing data viz and science uh, visualizations of what could possibly be going on underneath Europa. So within the first couple of years, this is what I was able to apply my skills to. It was more meaningful, it was factual, and quite frankly, a lot more fun. Um, but it didn't stop there. So then suddenly, if you go to the next slide, slide 10, then they were like, hey, do you know anyone that can sculpt a giant moon of Enceladus? And I was like, me, I can. I used to do that for TV commercials and everything else. So I sculpted this giant moon of Enceladus down to the detail of, of the actual typography. Um, and it was shooting out geysers. And uh, the teams took it, took it around and talked to it. That's Linda Spilker talk, talking about Enceladus there. And this thing went to Comic-Con and South by Southwest, different museums. Kids are climbing all over it. You know, we had to clean it, 
all the time and repaint it because kids were just wanting to get in there and really understand this thing and learn it. So again, I was shocked. So that was more of an outward facing way that I was able to help as well, but then also internally. So if you go to the next slide, uh, slide 11, you know, I actually got to help our ops lab team created a life-size replica space hatch for the space station uh, because at that time, astronauts were using these giant binders of instructions to figure out how to do things on the space station. So our ops lab team just figured out how to put the instructions in Oculus for our, for our astronauts so that they can see the instructions floating over whatever they needed to work on. So in order to do that, they needed a life-size space hatch. So I say all of this because I had no idea how I could contribute when I first started. And now it's been about 10 years at being able to assist people like Morgan and so many engineers and scientists with what it is that they need to do and accomplish and communicate that to the public. So if you go to slide 12, this is now the studio. So it's been over 10 or over 10 years. The studio has formed. We sit within something called the design lab um, at, at JPL. And that's all we do. We help uh, engineers and scientists think through their thinking. We help them brainstorm and really, uh, really flex out their ideas and ask great questions. But then we also assist uh, the missions whenever they're they're going and and how how to communicate these things to the public in in amazing ways. Um, so yeah, so I, I, if I could replace artist uh, Brian, I would replace artist with communicator. And if I could replace art, I would replace it with communication because that, that's essentially what we do, artists at uh, JPL and NASA. We help communication. I think that's a wonderful way to put it. Um, and in the lead up to this talk, we saw a few folks uh, surprised that NASA and JPL had artists. Now, some people think this is a relatively new thing, but that's not the case, is it? No, that's not the, it's not a new conversation. It may seem like it, uh, because I think a lot of people have the misunderstanding that when you attach art to science, or especially art to NASA, that it's, it's some random person in a smock in a corner talking to themselves, throwing paint everywhere, charging the taxpayer, and, and that's, that's what art and science is, right? But it's not. I mean, I do, I do stand in the corner and talk to myself sometimes, but that's beside the point. <laughs> so going back into history, if you want to go to slide 13, you know, art has been fully inscribed with science since the beginning. I mean, let's look at Aristotle in 300 BC, what that guy was talking about, the whole gamut of what he was talking about. I mean, back when science was being explored, uh, you know, there was really no way of understanding what these guys were talking about until, say, an artist like Peter Apian in, in the 1500s, <laughs> excuse me, started breaking down what these people were talking about into image form. That was the only way that we could understand the stars. And the heavens was through story and through imagery, you know, getting into Kepler, Kepler doing his own, um, you know, his own drawings and sketches of his discoveries, what he was thinking, of course, Leonardo da Vinci. And, you know, as you get into the 1600s, there were actual engravers that started breaking down the science that was being talked about at that time into almost comic book form. So as you can see, there's, there's a whole image there about metaphysics, right? So this is the only way that these complex things that were being discovered could be communicated to the general public. So as we go to the next slide, now we're heading to the 1700s and watch out, these are the Marias showing up. Both of these Marias, um, actually women were pioneers in the field of art and science. So Maria um, Marian was uh, from Germany. She was drawing beetles and bugs and plants in for the purpose of studying so that other people could study these things. And then Maria, uh, Imart was an astronomer and also doing some amazing artwork to, to show what it is that she was seeing. Um, There's also another woman um, that was particularly one of, known as one of the first photographers, and she was a botanist around that time as well. So that's, you know, we're in the 1700s now. So I, I do want to point out another artist. If we go to the next slide, slide 15. This, this may be, not be somebody you've heard of, but this gentleman was a pioneer in the field of, of data visual, visualization. So this is W.E.B. Uh, du Bois or Dubois, but uh, he was a sociologist and he was a professor back in, in 1899. He, he and a team were coming up with uh, data, over 63 data visualizations of what was happening to slaves when they were freed and in, in entering into society. And so no one had seen this stuff before. But this, this group was creating these, these early, early, early on data visualization, uh, visualizations to help communicate 
and educate people and help them understand what was happening. So again, we're going into the you know 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, uh, where art is being used to help people communicate and understand. We haven't even gotten to the space race yet. If you want to go to slide 16, so of course with space you now have physics and engineering going to next levels. So why wouldn't art go with them to help communicate these com incredibly complex things? So I started digging around our archives at JPL uh, because that's what I do during my lunch. Most people interact. I sit in a corner and talk to myself and look at the archives. So I found this amazing photo. This is a supercomputer, right? You've got two people there crunching data, pressing buttons. It's making noises. It spits out a card, and, and, and that's, that's like something massively ingenious. But I noticed what was on the right there that little board in the back there. Um, that is a obviously a graphic that is the flight plan to the moon. So someone did that. I was immediately like, oh, wait, somebody did that. And that would have been my job had I been back then. So where does, where does art exist internally at JPL and NASA? I wanted to really look for that. So uh, digging a little bit deeper, Brian, um, in terms of the history of artists supporting NASA in the space industry since the beginning, you know, if you want to go to slide 17, I found out that uh, JPL actually had an art director back in 1952. And his name was Art Beam, and of course his name's Art. Uh, but he led a team of 14 women and seven men known as the Graphics Group. Now, this is this is before the moon. Like this is this is at the start of the space race. Artists were a key part at the very beginning, supporting these scientists and engineers with brainstorming, figuring out what it is they were going to do, and communicating to the public what, what was going to happen. So then we get in. So that was the you know, the fifties, and and now we get into the sixties. NASA has been formed. Um, if you want to go to slide eighteen, NASA has been formed in the in the sixties. Uh, the NASA administrator James Webb decided we need to create an art program because data is not communicating to everyone. We want everyone from PhD level people down to students to understand and be excited about this exploration and innovation that's happening. So an art program was created where artists like Norman Rockwell and Andy Warhol and even Anna Leibovitz were simply given access. That's it. You have access as an artist to what NASA is doing, full access. And we want you to then go back and do your interpretation of what you saw, what you smelled, what you heard. And there was an amazing amount of art uh, created. And so that program existed in the 60s, 70s. It ended up ending in the 90s. It was run by um, by Bert Ulrich, who's currently at headquarters, one of our liaisons for media and special projects. But uh, what an exciting program that was. And it was in the 60s. Now, quickly, as we get into the 70s, um, Ames, NASA Ames started inviting in, if you want to go to the next slide in 19, NASA Ames started inviting in amazing artists to get involved in what would the future look like. Artists started to be included in early formulation of projects. And what could things look like in the future? Also in the 70s, speaking of future, if you want to go to slide 19, at JPL was a uh, computer lab um, started uh, by a gentleman named Bob Holtzman, who had some money, bought a bunch of equipment, pulled some talented people together and said, figure out what this stuff does. So, so in the early 70s, you had an individual named Dr. Jim Blinn who was one of the pioneers of early 3D graphics animation, contributing to spaceflight operations, figuring out spacecraft uh, planetary encounters, doing animations that were being sent to the news and media. Um, so this is way ahead of a time. And I, I had the privilege of talking with uh, Dr. Blinn, and he was telling me, yes, people from early, early Pixar, people who are starting Lucasfilm were coming to them to find out what is going on here. So computer 3D graphics were pioneered by NASA. I'm just going to say that. I'm throwing that out there. So quickly as we get into slide 21, then the 80s hit, and I honestly, may, I'm maybe a little biased. I'm an 80s kid, but I really think that's when NASA solidified itself in culture with art. Um, I don't think there was a bedroom that didn't have a, a NASA poster on it. The NASA worm logo, which has had a, a, a resurgence. It, it just a lot of people love the, the 80s NASA because they were cranking out a lot of uh, great art from, from artists. Then as we got into the 90s and 2000s, I think once the shuttle program ended, people thought maybe NASA went away, um, which is unfortunate. But NASA was just as busy doing amazing things. But I think artistically, in terms of the artists in stride with uh, engineers and scientists, it went more internal to help figure out what is our vision now? What, what should we be doing? And then lastly, as we get to slide 23, or sorry, 22, um, you know, that leads us to today. So I believe in 2012, 
Curiosity landed on Mars with a lot of drama and excitement. And I really think that that resuscitated uh, a lot of excitement around space and exploration. And then along with 2015, there were some exoplanet posters, which we're going to be kind of talking about today. There were some posters to, to, to real worlds out there that went viral online. And I remember one of the comments said, finally, NASA is creating art for people again. And so over the, these past probably 10 years, um, we have seen a resurgence of the arts in uh, a lot in stride with NASA, not only externally, but also internally um, with with artists and designers accompanying uh, scientists and engineers in early early development of uh, of missions. So I, I'm going to summarize by this because I really want to get back to to Morgan and and kind of what the program is. But I really felt like I had to kind of state the case that this has always been around. Uh, it's always been a key part of exploration, and uh, it shouldn't go away. Because here here's the thing: if if we go to slide 23, these are all the people involved. Uh, I would say with NASA or just space in general or innovation and exploration, you know, you've got NASA headquarters, you've got the different centers and facilities, there's like 15 or 20 of them. Um, you have all your engineers, you have all your scientists, you have your public engagement people, your other NASA specialists, your web developers, software, you have all of those people. Then you have news and media, right? Now you have those people, both internally and news and media out in the world. Now you have schools and universities, you have the general public. So this is NASA. It's not one person sitting in a room coming up with something and then they release it in the news. NASA is very transparent. They're working with tons of specialists on everything. That's a lot of communication, a lot of different people from students to PhD level people. This is where this is where artists live. This is where art lives. If you go to the next slide. This is where art lives, lives in between all of these people. They are the bridge builders of communication between all of these people. Um, if you go to the next slide. The reason being is, uh, you know, you have your data, you have your research, you have your facts, you have your science, you have your brilliant things that Morgan is spending her daily life discovering and figuring out. She has to now communicate that to the widest audience possible. Otherwise, you're just a musician making music for yourself, right? There's no point in it. There's no point in doing the research if you're not going to communicate it to people all the way from PhD level professionals down to children and that's where art comes in because art is a universal language it's visual so no matter who you are where you are what age you are what level of education you are it is possible to look at something and get a general understanding of what things like morgan are, are talking about so again if i can replace art with communication that is the role of an artist at, at jpl nasa but not, you know we're not just painters if you can go um go to a slide to to the next slide, <laughs> 24. At JPL in NASA, we have so many incredible people outside of engineering and science that work as communicators. They're, the, they're visual strategists, that's what my title is. We have news teams, we have social media people, incredible writers, photographers, film and video people, education specialists, um, outreach, public engagement, uh, web developers, AR, VR, ASMR, whatever, all the R's, printing specialists, archives, historians. We have all of these incredible people that fill in those spaces to do one thing, and that is to help take these incredibly complex things and communicate it to as many people as possible. And I just kind of want to end with this quote. This is going back to the NASA art program uh, where Lester Cook said, I hope the future generations will realize that we have not only the scientists and engineers capable of shaping the destiny of our age, but artists worthy to keep them company. So NASA is humanity's R&D division. Space is, is the place of the greatest complexities and mysteries and, and impossibilities that humans need to innovate. It stretches us to innovate. And as scientists and engineers innovate in that space, there need to be artists going alongside them to help communicate those things to the public so that we can all be excited, right? So thanks for letting me share all that. I felt like it was important. I would love to uh, get back to Morgan and really start diving in deep into some of these really complex things that none of us study except for her. Thank you, Joby. We're going to get to that in just a second. Um, earlier this week, our wonderful social media team created a poll for you, our audience, asking which exoplanet we should use for our discussion tonight. As we say, this is your space program. We want you to be involved in the conversation. You kind of guided it this evening for us. Now, if we pull those results up, uh, that's 28B, 
you'll see the voters decided on Super Earth, Super Ocean. The planet you chose is called Kepler 22b. Uh, we asked you to choose this to give our speakers a target. Now, they didn't know what exoplanet y'all were going to choose until earlier today. Uh, essentially, we, everybody not Morgan and Joby, are going to sit in on a meeting with them. Uh, this isn't a real mission. We're not actually sending a mission to this exoplanet, but we will be using real science for this discussion. Now, if you're an artist watching at home and want to follow along and create something of your own, please do and post it on social media and tag us at hashtag NASA exoplanets. Now I'm going to throw it over to Morgan. It's your meeting. Awesome. Well, Brian, thanks so much. And Joby, I'm so excited to work with you on this, just as excited as I am anytime we get to sit down and come up with something new together. I couldn't imagine better company as well. So yeah, super excited. Let's start thinking about what we can do for Kepler 22b. This is the exoplanet that you all chose. I should note the other two options were really exciting as well, but this one was honestly my favorite. Uh, the other two, one was more of a Hoth-like world, very cold, frigid on the outside, might have some interesting things, maybe an ocean going on underneath. Uh, the other one, that star-hugging sub-Neptune, think of that more like Cloud City. It's a place that may not have any ground at all that we might send a balloon to one day, that would be cool, but we're going to focus on Earth's twin, Kepler 22b. So Joby, I think what we're going to do now is we're going to come up with essentially a, a, a poster. We usually use these when we advertise proposals or when we start to work on mission concepts that we want to send to the world one day, and this helps us visualize and also communicate this idea of what our mission concept is like and what it's going to do at this alien world. And so Kepler 22b is a really fascinating place. It's about twice as big as Earth, but it's also orbiting a very similar star in the habitable zone. And that's really exciting for those of us who study astrobiology and astrochemistry, because this may hold liquid water and some similar building blocks to uh, Earth and could potentially be a place where life might have already formed or, or could still form and definitely a worthy place to study. Yeah, that's amazing. So usually what happens is, um, you know, Morgan will set up a meeting. I'll go down to her office and um, kind of set up shop or um, of course there's the formalities because I know Morgan and I'll be like, hey, did you go unicycle mountain biking this weekend or something? Which she does, which is insane. So, uh, you know, we'll talk a little bit, but there really isn't anything beyond me just going, Morgan, you want to do a mission to this planet, you know, tell me about why. Tell me what's so special about this planet. And then I'll start to piece together some visuals for this proposal cover. So I know that there are some formalities with proposal covers. They're eight and a half by 11. And they usually, um, I'm just hoping you can see my screen here. Uh, so so usually, uh, you know, it's eight and a half by 11. And then you have some formalities. You usually have signatures of somebody down here, which would be Morgan. You'd have some, some technicalities because it is a proposal cover. This is legit. They're going to be talking about science. They're going to be talking about the spacecraft. They're going to be talking about everything in it. So I know I can't do anything down here. I'm going to be, use, I'm going to be doing everything up in here. So I'm essentially doing a movie poster almost. I'm going to get people excited. Can I communicate what's going on in one image? So Morgan, tell me about Kepler 22B. I'm actually going to type it in here. And um, first of all, is that correct? You are so close. Actually, do you mind making that B lowercase? That's actually really important when it comes to naming exoplanets. We tend to use those capital letters for the stars that uh, we identify. And so if you kept it as a capital B, people might think we were going to visit the, the sun, essentially, of this solar system. Oh, wow. OK, yeah. so I'm going to change this to a lowercase, lowercase b. b. Perfect. How is that? Okay. That looks awesome. Yeah, so Kepler is the mission that discovered this world. 22, in this case, is because this is the 22nd star that looks like it might have planets around it. Uh, there's some probabilities associated with that, but we're pretty confident that these worlds exist. And then once we've identified them through all sorts of different ways you can hunt these exoplanets, then we start to give them letters. And they're identified in order, starting with the letter B. A is reserved for the most massive thing. 
in the solar system, which is usually the host star. And so this was the first one discovered, which is why it's got that lowercase b. All right. Amazing. So, okay. So I here, notice what, uh, what are you doing down at the bottom there, Joby? What's what that? am I doing down at the bottom? I'm going to start working on your planet. So I, I don't, you know, if as you're sort of describing the planet, I, um, I wanted to kind of piece something together there. I figure, you, you know, let's let's at least get this on there. Um, now there are people who, who when they have more time, are going to be, you know, they they dive into 3D, you know, 3D stuff to really get this stuff um, sitting right. But uh, for the sake of time, I'm literally just going to be kind of bending this stuff on there. But Morgan, I want to get this as close as possible to what it is that you're thinking is going on on this planet down there. So you mentioned clouds. Um, what what kind of, does it have an atmosphere? What's going on on there um, as I just sort of piece this thing together? Yeah, no, that's a great question, Joby. We do think that this world has an atmosphere based on its size and where it's orbiting in the habitable zone. So that means it's in that Goldilocks spot where it's not too hot, not too cold, but just right. So we think this one may be a bit more Earth-like. I think it's going to have water vapor and water clouds, so white colored clouds, just like we have here on Earth. And I'm noticing that you've got a lot of sort of reds and oranges in there, but I'm hoping since this world is in that habitable zone that it may have some blues and greens. It may have Absolutely. liquid water, potentially some oceans. So I don't know if you can tweak the colors a bit, but that would be really nice. Absolutely. Let's do that now. Sweet. So that yeah, this one's good. actually in orbit around, oh, that's starting to look pretty good. Uh, this is in orbit around a very similar star to our sun. It's a G class or a yellow dwarf. And so I think we would be within creative license to include some green in there for green okay. plants, right? And the reason I say that is because while there could be other types of plants that are different colors, life on Earth has adopted that green color because of the wavelengths coming from our sun, from our star. And since this one's orbiting a similar star, it's not unreasonable to think that maybe it might adopt similar pigments to absorb that that light and to do photosynthesis. So now that's starting to look a lot better. Okay. This is looking so, really yeah. great. So what is so you mentioned the starlight. What kind of a, what kind of starlight is it again? Would it what side would it be on? What's going on? With, um... That is another really great question. So when it comes to exoplanets, sometimes they can be tidally locked around their host star, which hmm. means that the same face, like maybe I can do a little demo here. So I've got, let's pretend like like this Rubik's cube is the sun and this Rubik's cube is a planet. Although, wait, let's switch that because this one's bigger. Okay, so this is the planet. And so, so in, instead of it orbiting like we do where we have night and day and this guy spins around, um, instead it would be tidally locked. So the same face would face the star the entire time. And that means really? that one side, See the, the white side will be really cold and and the blue side well it's not totally blue because i haven't solved this one yet would be really hot and yeah so joe that's perfect we would need a terminator something like that so we have a side that's in darkness a side that's in light now for kepler 22b we're actually not sure if it's tidally locked or not but we're we're going to just assume that it is because if we send a mission there one day we don't want to be surprised and have designed for a particular case that ends up not being correct. Uh, and so right. let's just assume that it's tidally locked for right now, but we'll keep our mission concept open so that we can be adaptive if indeed it's more Earth-like. Okay, let's do that. So we've got our tidally locked. We're 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 gonna nice. you know light on one side, dark on the other side. So what what exactly is uh, going on above there? Is there is there you know what are you sending there is there is it like an orbiter like this or is it is it you know a giant restaurant spaceship i don't know <laughs> so well it, it would also, have to also, be just pretty to, big just to let you guys just to let you guys know i i am given permission to ask the dumbest questions in the room so and i often do so a lot of times that gets morgan thinking differently of course they're not sending a giant restaurant out to kepler 22b but as I do inquire about what the spacecraft is, um, that gets her really thinking about, you know, her mission um, and how to communicate that best to, to people. So I, in a way, I represent the public as well. You totally do. And you always ask good questions, Joby. There are no stupid questions. 
Okay, this is great. I like the idea of putting in our spacecraft and I'm thinking it's going to have three pieces. It's going to have an orbiter, something that stays in space that will orbit around this planet. And mm -hmm. I think solar panels is the way to go here for power okay. uh, because it may take us a while to get there. So that looks really nice. But I'm thinking we're also going to want two landers. And okay. the reason that I say that we need two is because, well, first of all, if indeed this moon, or sorry, this world is tidally locked, it would be really fascinating to send one to the sunlit side and one to the, the side that's forever in darkness to compare right. and contrast and, and study between them. And also, if we send two landers, then we have redundancy. If something happens or goes wrong with one, we can still get plenty of data from another. And so which, what um, prototype are you pulling up there? That looks really neat. I think it's the Huygens probe. Nice, um, the Huygens probe. That's, that is near and dear to my heart because that was part of the Cassini mission. Uh, Cassini awesome. went to, to Saturn and it explored Saturn and its rings and moons and brought along with it a collaboration from the European Space Agency, which is a probe that landed on Saturn's moon Titan. And it's actually perfect that you picked that, Joby, because when Huygens was designed, we didn't know if Titan had solid land or if it was covered in oceans of liquid methane and ethane. And so they designed that probe so it could float. Even if there was just liquid around, it would still work just fine. And I think that's what we would want to design for this exoplanet as well in this mission concept. Because uh, we don't know if there's actually going to be solid rocky ground until we get there. And by then it's too late to, you know, oops, let's go back to Earth. Let's pick up a different kind of probe and come back. That would that would take too long. I don't want to wait that yeah. long. Yeah. Nice. So we'll send two. So we'll send one to the sunlit side, one to the dark side. I really like what you're doing here. Maybe we could also include something to show. Oh, those colors are cool. Oh, that looks really awesome. You're so good at this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm flying here. Great. I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying Morgan. I'm trying. Um, so, so what we're going to add, so I know that these, I know that these, uh, these probes, one's going to go, one's going to go to the left. One's going to go to the, one's going to go to the dark. One's going to go to the light. Correct. Yes. So, so probably should show some, some way of doing that. I'm going to, I'm going to continue messing with these, but you know, for now, perhaps we don't, do the color but uh, i i do want to show you know some way of of that that you know yeah what like the trajectory or something yeah, yeah correct so yeah something like that is pretty good i really like how you sort of got this nice kind of left and right dark and light it's it's really got some some cool feel to it and yeah, we, we would want to show the trajectories. And I don't know if there's space or a way that we could show. We'll probably have to use parachutes or something for these guys to land because uh, this okay. has an atmosphere. So chances are we will probably employ something similar to how we land mm -hmm. our rovers on Mars, where we use supersonic or hypersonic parachutes and then some combination of retro rockets at the end. And the nice thing about that is if we come to this alien exoplanet and we find the atmosphere surprisingly thick or surprisingly thin, we may still be able to use some combination of those to land. I don't know if that's going to mess up the flow of the image, but it might be neat to include uh, maybe like a parachute or something like that in there. Although yeah, where they absolutely. are right now, they're pretty high up. That would get deployed later. Hmm. Well, we can show that kind of a, um, you know, do you want to show stages of, of things or, um, you know, I just that's a really good idea. You know, do that then uh try and fix this a little bit what would the final step be kind of just to make sure we get enough time for audience questions and i could watch you do this all day what would kind of be the last step that you both have in this meeting yeah well i think we would want to show maybe something about the science that we might discover and to me one of the most exciting aspects of visiting a world like this would be to search for biosignatures evidence of life. And that could take the form of molecules like amino acids. It could take the form of looking for cells or, you know, even techno signatures if there's actually a civilization here. But Joby, I wonder if there's a way that we could include something maybe up in one of the corners or I don't know, you're the expert on where it should go. But maybe do you have like any example molecules that we could drop in there? 
I do. Let me let me pull that down. So you know, let's see. Maybe like boom that. Oh yeah, that's maybe, perfect. What is that? That's, that's like is that histidine? That's a little, I think. I'm not sure. You nice. know, you would know that. Yeah, that's an amino um, acid, which is great. The, these make great biosignatures. Uh, so this is actually perfect. Uh, these types of molecules. All Earth life uses them. We find them all over the solar system. So they're made, some of them are made abiotically too, not by life, but life uses them. And when life uses them, it will uh, make more of some and less of another and create these funky patterns that we can then detect. And so I really like using that as a good example because that might actually be one of the ones that we include in our, our science traceability where we target those molecules specifically. So that's looking really, really nice. I would um is it okay that they're sort of you know spinning around a little bit and i mean maybe i'll that's it's a little kind of on the nose i might i might kind of play those back a little bit but um but in fact let's let's try this i'm gonna uh, get a little rd on you and Ooh. you know see let's let's see what happens you know something something along these lines um that can help pop some of these things oh wow it's kind of dreamy um oh that's super cool so, wait go back what was that oh that looks amazing one? uh one, one more wait no keep that is that too much that, that might be too much you're i trust your judgment Joby. i can i can i can scale it back just a hair Ooh. Um, oh that looks amazing it, it might be a little blown out uh might be a little blown out Cause who are you, who are you, who's going to be looking at this Morgan? So this is going to go to a review board of very, you know, top notch, best in their game, in their field, scientists and engineers will look at this proposal and they'll check our science. They'll check our spacecraft and our engineering to make sure that what we're proposing to build is going to work the way that we think it's going to work. And that will answer the science questions that we're trying to ask. And so it's going to go to a lot of people at NASA headquarters and, and all sorts of places. And then if this gets picked, this is the kind of poster that we will use to tell the public about this amazing new mission. It's not a real mission. This is just a, an example concept, but this is the type of thing that we would then use to advertise, which is so cool. Very cool. Yeah, we that um, is beautiful. I love it. I'm, I'm just going to. And well, then, and then, makes uh, final I'll, I'll, I'll meet with her. I'll do some. Yeah, I'm just going to kind of, um, you know, do some final touches on it. This is where I tinker, and we'll often go back and and give Morgan like, you know, five or six options, almost um, of, you know, what about this? What about that? Um, is this okay? Is that okay? You know messing around with literal messing around with you know what's not literal um getting super rd not getting rd so just whatever communicates the best the best thing is uh um usually what i'll kind of dive into off offline because morgan's very busy <laughs> she's, uh, we're uh, all busy but i think that's perfect i call it done let's let's take that to the printers and run with it Okay, so, so I have, and then I, I always do one more layer of just playing around just for oohs and ahs, um, just to see. So while Joby does that happens. final layer of, of playing around and for the oohs and ahs, I actually want to ask Morgan, since Joby talked a little bit about the history of this place, well, he keeps continuing to fiddle with that. Um, what's essentially the future of this relationship? Well, I Esteem. think... Maybe we've demonstrated here, just uh, giving you a taste of how crucial art is to science, the science process, to answering the questions, figuring out those answers, at, you know, asking the questions, figuring out those answers, and then communicating it to the public, to the rest of the world. So every time that I meet with someone like Joby, I end up thinking about things in a different way. I end up uh, looking at things from a different perspective because that's what Joby brings. Uh, he and other artists at JPL and other places, 
They have a, a very diverse set of experiences. And anytime you can bring that into a team and interleave all of your different backgrounds, your ideas, uh, you end up with something much stronger. And so being able to integrate art in an early stage like this into a concept makes it much stronger and it makes us better as scientists in terms of how we frame even the basic things like our questions and our science. Very cool. Um, I see Joby is still working on it. So we're going to get to your yeah, questions I'll here while he's I'll still stop, messing around. Never stops, never stops. Can't stop, won't stop. Um, but I want to thank them both because I'm now going to throw it over to Thalia for some audience questions. But before we do, she does have something she wants to share with all of us, particularly you, the audience today. I do. Thank you, Brian. Uh, so if we can pull up slide 38, um, speaking of art and science and amazing exoplanets and the technology that we use to discover them, um, we have a brand new poster that has been released today. Um, it is featuring the Spitzer Telescope, um, which is a telescope that has been used to characterize and discover many exoplanets, along with a lot of other amazing science that it has at that it has done for astrophysics. Um, but if you would like to download the, download the poster, I'm sorry, uh, visit exoplanets.nasa.gov. Um, we will be releasing a new one each week. So stay tuned to see all of the amazing exoplanet telescopes that we use to find and characterize these planets. Wonderful. And what questions do we have out there? I imagine there were a lot because I'm full of questions right now too. Yes, so we have a lot of amazing questions right now. Um, but why don't we start off with um, one from LinkedIn. So Phyllis on LinkedIn asks, do you find that the process of creating art contributes to innovation by helping the scientists see their concept in a new way? I know you talked a little bit about this, Morgan, but have you yourself experienced a moment where you've um, you know, seen science in a different way after having a meeting with someone like Joby? Oh, totally. I mean, sometimes we'll, we'll engage uh, with Joby very early in the process or artists like him, and uh, they'll point out something that we were so, you know, deeply entrained in the, the idea of the concepts that we didn't stop to take a, look, a step back and take a look and be like, oh, man, yeah, that's right. This, this um, maybe this instrument isn't going to fit the way that we expected or boy that whole spacecraft looks really boxy and we're going to be landing someplace like titan we need to make this more aerodynamic because it's got an atmosphere there are a lot of different things that artists can bring to us early in a concept or even later on as we're starting to do tweaks to think about things like foot pad designs uh, how they might interact with the surface um, artists can also weigh in on things like that as well. So it's really amazing to be able to have that perspective uh, at every stage of mission development, not just in the early stages, not just in the end when we're working on the proposal, but at, throughout the entire process. Excellent. So we have a lot, a lot more questions. Um, and let's see if either you or Joby can answer this one. So Lisa on Facebook asks, for meetings such as these, what is your deadline to create a poster? Now, I have been heavily involved in the creation of posters before, especially with Joby, um, but I would like to hear what you guys would have to say um, in terms of trying to meet deadlines, um, especially when you're trying to put together a proposal. What might that deadline look like? Well, whenever we work on mission proposals, this is something that we usually start sometimes many years in advance of when we plan on delivering what is essentially a book with this beautiful cover on it to NASA. And so some things will start very early and we like to impose our own internal deadlines to keep us from getting you know right up to the wire such that we have plenty of time to iterate on one of these drafts, send it around for internal review, have a few other people look at it as well who've never seen it before and see if they can get that concept that we're trying to convey. So we mm -hmm. might take this poster uh, that Joby is tweaking and without us saying a word, hand it to someone else and be, be like, what does this tell you? And they may look at those, those two landers that we're designing and they may say, oh, well, are those, are those separate orbiters? Is it, are those lander, you know, if they can get that, oh, there's an orbiter, it's gonna have two landers that'll go down and I see the, the world has two different sides, one's in light and one's in darkness. Oh, okay, I get it. You guys are gonna send two different landers there to study the two different sides of this tidally locked world. 
That's what we would like because we're not going to be there standing over this reviewer shoulders as they're reading our proposal. Our graphics, our science, everything in there needs to stand by itself and speak for itself. And so that's what Joby does is he he gives us this beautiful word, this music that we can use to convey these concepts and hopefully win uh, those the hearts and minds of all of those people so that they'll fund this mission and we can do the science we want to do. Yes. It's, Great. Yeah. So, oh, go ahead. I was going to move on to the next question. Um, and Absolutely. I think this one's probably for you. Um, so Strawberry Muffin on YouTube asks, what would you have to major in in order to have uh, a job as an artist working with scientists at NASA? Well, Strawberry Muffin, you're already off to mm -hmm. a good start with that creative name. So I, I would say that the, the number of people that work in our studio and um, in comm, so of course, if you're working in communications, there are communication majors. But in terms of our studio, in terms of an artist supporting scientists and engineers, I've found that, you know, I have an industrial design degree. So that sort of taught me the gamut of, of illustration, graphics, learning a lot of the digital art tools. I started with a foundation of sketching. If anyone wants to know where to start, even scientists and engineers, start to learn how to draw and sketch. There are so many classes online, you can do it. But learn how to draw, learn how to get your ideas down quickly. Then I went into learning 2D programs, graphic design, then learning mm -hmm. in 3D programs. But the reason I industrial design has helped me is because I have to build things. I have to use my hands all the time. I'm constantly building things, setting things up. Um, so either in an in industrial design degree or we have a lot of product designers. Um, just anything that can teach you the 2D elements and getting into making things, into 3D printers, things like that. Because, so you're going to be talking to a lot of different people. They're going to want a lot of different things, everything from from a graphic to can you build me this that shows up here and does this. So um, we have people who are animation folks. Uh, we, we have people with uh, graphic design degrees. We have mm -hmm. people who are producers on music videos, um, helping orchestrate our, our uh, site visits and, and proposal showings and things like that. So it really is quite a good gamut of, of mm -hmm. people, uh, but it starts with being creative start to use your hands, start to understand some of the tools, and I think you should be good to go. If you're wondering where to start, I would start at a university. Um, NASA, JPL have great internships. You can get in for those. But I would say support your local school, support your local university and their science departments, and, um, and figure out how to support them with your art. Morgan, don't, don't, be, don't be angry, but I took your science molecules off of here um, just to keep it simple. We can put, we can put those inside, or, or if, when I have more time, I'm going to figure out uh, other ways to, to kind of get them in there. That's okay. You know what? I think I like it, this cleaner version without them. And I think this leaves us open for more creativity when it comes to people imagining what we might search for on this world instead of just upfront telling them. So I, I really like yes. what you've done with this, Joby. As always, brilliant work. Oh, thank you, Morgan. Starts with you. Everything starts with a science question, right? I'm happy to be a part Speaking of the start, of, but you definitely bring us to the finish. Well, very nice. We've got time for one last final question, and then we're going to have to wrap it up. That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> All right. So a question for both of you. Uh, Nirun on YouTube asks, what is the most memorable, memorable project that you both worked on? Oh, oh my gosh. I don't know. Yes, I do. I think, well, that oh, that is so hard. Okay. I would say one of the most memorable experiences so far was when I was a part of the Cassini mission. Uh, right near uh, the, the end of Cassini's life, it was running out of gas, and we didn't want it to just drift around in the Saturn system uh, because it was a victim of its own success. We actually found places mm -hmm. with liquid water out as far as Saturn. Cassini discovered that. But then that meant that uh, Cassini, which we cleaned, but we didn't sterilize because we didn't think we needed to, uh, it might have brought some microbial hitchhikers along with it. So we had to put Cassini in a safe place where it couldn't contaminate these worlds potentially with Earth life. And so for Cassini's grand finale, we did this beautiful swan dive into Saturn, a place that does not have liquid water. And 
we knew that we would be able to preserve these future worlds like Enceladus and Titan for uh, future robotic explorers and who knows, maybe even humans to, to step foot on them one day. And I remember being with all of the scientists and all of the engineers who'd ever been involved with Cassini. We all came back together at like five in the morning, of course, because you can't control where the planets are. Um, and when, when it did that beautiful swan dive and we said farewell to Cassini, and that was such an amazing thing. Is one of the things that, that Joby helps us do, that the artists help us do, is bring these spacecraft to life. You know, it was part of our family. It was it was something that was so familiar to us that we grew to love that became a part of us. And it was incredibly difficult to say goodbye to that spacecraft. But the knowledge that we have from spacecraft like that, now we get to apply to new missions, like concepts like the one that we were um, messing around with today. And that I think is the most inspiring thing that we're always learning something new and then we get to apply it to these new worlds and I'll be falling in love again with the next spacecraft that we send. And I think for me, uh, well, Cassini was incredibly beautiful. I was in the room for that as well. And, um, but I have, I would have to say that, you know, the, the surprise and explosion of these, these traveling to other worlds, uh, posters that came out in 2015, um, we were shocked at, at their popularity. Uh, no one saw it coming, and um, and we were able to do more called Visions of the Future. Uh, we got a ton of schools writing to us of of kids making their own travel posters to other planets. It was a way to learn about the planet. So I think that was probably my favorite um, project that I worked on, and uh, something that my mother is tired of me talking about. Quite frankly, I'm kidding. Um, so good times, good times. That is all the time that we have tonight. Uh, please join us next month for our talk, Psyche, Mission to a Metal World with Dr. Lindy Elkins Tanton. Remember, folks, the posters are available online, and those links will be in the chat. I would like to thank our terrific speakers, Dr. Morgan Cable and Joby Harris. Um, as we're about to lead out, if we could bring up what the final parts of that poster, while well, I'm thanking everybody else, what we got to today, just did that tonight. Um, thank you to our co-host, Talia Khan, um, and everyone behind the scenes who make these talks possible. And finally, a big, big thank you to all of you who join us every single month. Stay safe, stay kind, stay curious, and we'll see you in August.